So, so no, no podium mic? <laughs> there was another mic here a minute ago. I think we're going to wait a few more minutes. Uh, there are uh, obviously some folks still enjoying themselves downstairs. So um, let's just give a few more minutes for people to come up. Hopefully they'll notice we're gone and wonder where we are and follow us. Jen, is she? Uh... Uh, she was on her way up here. Okay, good. <laughs> Can't do this without her. Yeah, I know. Is this, is no, this, is this say, uh, Jane? Uh, yes, Jane. Hi, Jane. Oh, Jane. Hey, Glenn. So nice to see you. Yeah. You're like a 22 year old. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Good to go? Okay, yeah. That's your notes. Those are my notes, yeah. Okay. 
two at the camera. Okay, perfect. Be careful, this, uh, this cord is easily picked over. So, uh, welcome everybody. We are so, so, so pleased to see you and to be back in person. This is the first forum lecture in person in over two years. So, the fact that we can get together uh, in person uh, and indeed interact with our speaker in person um, is, is just a well, something we've learned not to take for granted, that's for sure. So, we're absolutely delighted to be here and we're absolutely delighted to be in the Ottawa Art Gallery. This is an amazing facility. Um, I think of some of our students, hopefully a few of you are here, may not know this facility or this, this institution. So it's, it's great for you to come down and to, to discover it. Uh, it's just one of uh, Ottawa's great resources and we uh, look forward to, uh, to introducing you to this and other resources as you finally find your way around the city. So welcome everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first of six lectures that will comprise this year's Forum Lecture Series. And my name is Benjamin Johnny. I'm an associate professor at the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism, and I coordinate the school's undergraduate urbanism program. And it's been my privilege to, to organize the lecture series this year. And I should start by thanking our founding sponsors uh, for the series, namely Trinity Development, uh, Merkley Supply, Hogan Architecture, GRC Architects, Charles Ford Developments, and IBI Architects. These firms uh, pulled together uh, a few years back and created an endowment that allows us to stage the lecture every year uh, and just spend endowment money, it's not to spend any endowment. So it's a, really, it's a real pleasure, pleasure. And a real commitment on the part of the sponsors to bring uh, a discussion about architecture out of the campus and out of the school and into the public realm. Um, and so again, being able to, to meet in a venue like this, in a location like this is extremely important to us. So thank you very much. I see John here. I'm not sure if there are others. <laughs> thank you, John. And thank you, Martin, um, <laughs> for, uh, for your support. Now this whole series is called Perspectives. And it includes a range of speakers and topics covering architecture, urbanism, conservation, and adaptive reuse which are the areas on which the school's various programs uh, focus. As you might know, we have three undergraduate majors, one in design, one in urbanism, and one in uh, conservation and sustainability. We have a, a professional master's of architecture. We're about to introduce a new master of adaptive architecture. Mariana is here, uh, which will be our first graduate program in, uh, in conservation and adaptive reuse. And I think uh, we are well underway in planning with a new master's program called Master of Architecture and Urban Design. So we are uh, increasing uh, the number of programs we offer and, and bringing our specializations to the, uh, to the master's level as well. To kick off the 22-20 forum series, it gives me a, a tremendous pleasure to introduce one of our own, namely Jennifer Luce. Jennifer's practice is based in La Jolla, California, and those of us who went to school a little while ago uh, can't think of La Jolla without thinking about the Salk Center. I'm not sure if that's true of the current crop of, uh, so La Jolla is quite famous uh, in a place we all aspire to go to, and Jennifer actually got there. Um, she's also licensed in New York State, so she works in both states. Jennifer received her Bachelor of Architecture from Carleton University in 1984, and her Master of Design Studies from Harvard University in 1994. And she's a longstanding member of uh, the school's Israeli Advisory Council, and is a recipient of Carleton's Dunton Alumni Award of Distinction for her service uh, to the alumni of the university as a whole. And yeah, we'll forgive her for this, but she also serves on Harvard's Alumni Council and an Alumni uh, uh, Association Board. In recognition of her professional work, Jennifer was elevated to the College of the Fellows of the American Institute of Architecture. I guess that would be F, AIA, yeah. Which was the equivalent, Maria? F, RAIC? F, R, A, I, C. Uh, in 2016, and she has served on a variety of advisory boards for cultural institutions and currently chairs the AIA California Monterey Design Conference. In her personal life, Jennifer is a voracious art collector and passionate supporter of artists working in all media. Jennifer's firm, Loose, a studio, is a collaborative architecture design group that follows the legacy of the workshop or atelier model. The firm's cross-disciplinary approach supports and advances creative exploration 
uh, with an array of practitioners, including designers, artists, craftspeople, and thinkers. Uh, the studio prides itself on exploring each programmatic element with, quote, the rigor of a scientist and the poetry of an artist. Projects include cultural and arts facilities, workspaces, residences, urban design, and custom furniture projects. The studio also designs and commissions site-specific artworks for clients around the world. And the recent renovation of the Mingay International Museum was the topic of a feature article in the New York Times, which is showing up just at the very top in the sky there. Uh, <laughs> and so there's been national recognition for this project. Um, following the lecture, indeed, is a vernissage for an exhibition of work, a small exhibition of work uh, of Jennifer's studio uh, in the Art Engine space here in the Ottawa Art Gallery. The space is back downstairs just off the Jackson Cafe, where many of you entered the building, and we've set up, as you saw, a bar and in the Jackson Cafe space, and there's plenty of hors d'oeuvres to go around, so we invite everyone to follow us back down uh, to the Jackson Cafe uh, uh, and the art engine space immediately following the lecture. And somehow, I somehow managed to skip the fact that in addition to our forum sponsors, uh, who sponsor the entire series, we also have sponsors that join us for individual lectures. This particular lecture is being co-sponsored by ORSA, the Ottawa Regional Society of Architects, as is our next lecture, which is next week. Uh, and it's my pleasure, before introducing, actually, I've already introduced Jennifer, but before <laughs> letting Jennifer speak, uh, to introduce Christopher Moyce, who is uh, the chair of ORSA, to say a few words. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, as uh, many of you might know, we have uh, Architecture Week starting next week. Um, the theme this year is Reclaiming Normal. It's uh, connecting post-pandemic. Uh, it kicks off after the forum lecture uh, on Monday. And then on Tuesday night, we have a movie night. We've rented out the Bytown Theater for a filming of Her with Joaquin Phoenix. On Wednesday, we've got uh, Pecha Kucha back here at the OAG. Uh, and space is available. We have a couple of spots in case there are any uh, uh, budding um, uh, public speakers out there. Come after the lecture and talk to me, or else uh, you can email us at orsa at orsa.ca. And Thursday night, we're closing off with a panel discussion at the National Arts Centre. And our panelists, a very exciting lineup. We have Matthew Fleury, who's a city councillor, Anne Bordelow, who's the incoming director of the um, School of Architecture at uh, Carleton. Uh, Alain Miglez is the vice president of capital planning and chief planner at the NCC. And Inga Rusendahl, who's uh, the senior planner at the Ottawa Public Health. Uh, so uh, we're also looking for volunteers. Uh, for the next week. If anybody's interested, you can email me at orsa at orsa.ca or come talk to me afterwards. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Christopher. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Jennifer Luce. Let's see. Maybe, I'll... oh, there we go. Hi, everyone. Oh my gosh, this feels like a little bit of a homecoming. Um, 40 years later. <laughs> Hard to believe. <laughs> um, pretty much 40 years since I graduated from Carleton University. Uh, I've been in practice 30 years. And I've had about 20 years of involvement with the school as an alumni. And I'm really, really proud of that and thrilled. Um, just quickly want to thank the OAG for hosting us, uh, the School of Architecture for asking me to be here, and the Faculty of Engineering for supporting us, and also Art Engine who are hosting the Vernissage, so come later. I want to give a special thanks to Kyle Buston and Dave David Bastien Allard who uh, installed the exhibition with us this week, with me this week, the three of us, it was pretty fun. Um, their work is heroic. Uh, many thanks to Ryan Steck and Rameko Bulmer uh, from Art Engine for hosting us. And thanks to Steve and Ben and Federica for organizing everything. We, as a studio, acknowledge in Southern California that we sit on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Kumayai Nation. We also like to acknowledge that we gather here today 
on the unceded lands of the Algonquin nations and honor their stewardship of this very precious place. I wanna dedicate tonight to a series of strong women. Professor Nan Griffiths, <sighs> kind of get emotional on that one. Um, Nan would come into studio late at night, second year, and teach me how to draw because I didn't know how. And I was so frustrated and scared. And she taught me how to draw. Cheryl Boyle, for being such an amazing woman. Um, Cheryl came to San Diego with her students and reintroduced me to Carlton. Um, and I'm so grateful. Director, interim director, Federica Goffi. We've had such great conversations this year, and I thank you so much for all of it. And then my mom, Anne, <laughs> and my niece, Emma. So today I'm going to take you on a not so sappy, because I'm not going to cry, um, sentimental journey that leads from Carlton to uh, Mingay Museum. And it really is a journey that connects one to the other. There is nothing for me that happened in my career without thinking about what I learned at Carlton. Uh, we believe in a rich process, in deep, building deep relationships, and in collaboration as the key to meaningful projects, which is something I really, really, really learned at Carleton. Um, the project I'm gonna show you primarily has taken one third of my career. And it's that kind of dedication that um, I'm so, so passionate about and I'm really, really excited to show you. So, Art, architecture, and craft. So Minge is a museum of design, craft, and folk art. And we spent almost 10 years, three years developing exhibitions and seven years building a building to celebrate these things together. So this is our studio from 2003 to 2020. And this is our studio today in La Jolla. It's open, collaborative, and we're really, really so happy. We, I essentially spend my weekends just hanging out here because it's a wonderful collaborative space. Architecture, what, what we make. So I'm gonna go through 30 years of projects in about 30 seconds. I'm not gonna talk about them, I'm just gonna show you pictures. The beginning, a competition that I actually did in Ottawa and the result of that, a loft, Nissan design, a house, a house, a bed in a house, Nissan Detroit, Nissan Detroit in the winter, Nissan theater, Nissan collaboration with Claude Cormier from Montreal, a house in La Jolla for a scientist, a table for a museum, a building for Nissan for their um, technological machines, a table for an art curator, extraordinary desserts where you can dive into the most delicious food ever, a detail of that, the entry to that, the entry to um, a den of sin. Uh, a Chicago gallery, a desk for that same scientist at the Salk Institute could be one of the most really heartfelt projects I've done. Um, the Biennale in Venice with Todd Williams and Billy Sien, two people I met when I was here at Carleton. Originally, they've become such good friends over the years. They invited 30 architects to come and talk about their inspiration, and we were one of them. An apartment in the Zaha Hadid building in New York City. 
a center for architecture in San Diego, which has yet to be built. So, 30 years. <laughs> but what are we looking at in those 30 years? We're looking at art, particularly, something I'm incredibly passionate about. What we see, we see Todd Williams and Billy Sand making an exhibit for Noguchi and how light makes space. Robert Irwin, the light and space artist who lives in San Diego and is 96 years old now, um, making amazing work in the 1960s. Ronnie Horn talking about light and glass. Ellsworth Kelly making space with art. Anne Hamilton, my hero, making space with fabric. Robert Irwin at Marfa making space with scrim. Robert Irwin in Los Angeles doing the same. Robert Irwin at the Whitney in the 1970s doing the same. And Hamilton at the Armory in New York making this fantastic moving element that people were completely fascinated by. Martha Graham. Alex Soth photographing beautiful, vulnerable women. An incredible indigenous Canadian artwork about struggle and pain. Landscapes. Um, Burley Marx in South America. The Clark Center in uh, Massachusetts, another image with Clark. And New York City, Todd and Billy's apartment that I had the honor to stay in for a weekend and imagine how I could ever leave that place <laughs> directly centered on Central Park. So beautiful. Craft. So Mingay is a museum of craft and I, I feel like in so many ways it's the was the perfect project for us because we so believe in crafting and making things either by hand or digitally. These are the things that we covet. Um, Ted Muling, an incredible jewelry artist in um, New York City. Ted's work again. Eames, the splint made for the World War II warrior that essentially has become one of the pivotal artworks of contemporary industrial design. Venice, the Focolore, beautiful object that many architects have in their office, actually. And the surfboard. Coming to California, you have to love the surfboard. And Minge did a beautiful show about the making of surfboards. So Minge, um, Minge International Museum, there are only two Minge museums in the world. One is in Japan, in Tokyo, and the other is in San Diego. And there's a long story as to why, and I'll tell you that in a minute. But what is the meaning? So Sowetsu Yanagi on the left realized in 1926 that industrialization was taking away handcraft, taking away traditional ways of making things. And so he wrote a whole series of academic writings around how to save traditional craft. And then he began a guild, and that guild began um, training people and collecting. And so the museum in Tokyo is a wonderful place to visit because it, it really contains um, so many works from uh, Korea, Japan, China, all things of useful value um, that are made by hand. So this is the museum in Tokyo, which was founded in 1936. And this is probably the most coveted object in both museums. It's a tea whisk. And when I figured out or found out how such a thing is made, it astounded me. It is one piece of bamboo that's sliced by hand, one slice at a time. And it's this kind of perfection that Menge um, covets. Yanagi's son, Sori, became an industrial designer and, and designed the butterfly stool. 
And then this woman, Martha Longnecker from La Jolla, California, went to work with Yanagi in Japan and became obsessed with all the works that he supported. And she be also became friends with Nikki de saint Fall, who was a sculptor, a French sculptor, who also came to live in La Jolla. So another group of strong women founding a museum together. So we did a lot of research, and there are um, 26,000 objects in the museum's uh, collection. And um, everything from beautiful bowls to simple um, objects to um, wonderful paper sculptures to a bowl made out of leaves. And I, I was hooked. So we answered an RFP, and this is kind of a, I mean, a, a message for students and also for us professionals, but we answered an RFP to replace the floor in the museum. <laughs> and it went from a $2 million floor replacement to a $60 million project. And it didn't go that way because it went over budget. It went that way because we all decided on a journey with the board and the director and, and the visitors to expand the horizons of a place that had such an important story to tell. And storytelling is so critical in our culture. So it's a really, really wonderful journey. So it's located in historic Balboa Park, which was originally supposedly planned by the Olmsted brothers in the late 1800s. Um, and yet this was the site for the, the World's Exposition in 1915. It takes up a huge part of the city. Parallels, really, to Central Park in New York. And here was the site in 1915. The building here on the lower side is Minge's. Here was opening day. And I'm giving you a little hint of something I'm going to talk about later. But there's a series of women standing on the roof of the building. So we're on an adventure of uniting art, architecture, and craft in one building, one project with one intent. Let's go back to the tea whisk and think about how it's made and how carefully an artist thinks about um, the perfection of this object. So here's the park. Um, the yellow building is Minge's building. It's right on the Grand Square and probably the most important space in our city. So talking about being a scientist and a poet, we start our process with analysis. So we spent a whole week at a table, a whole group of us invited people like artists and filmmakers and poets to really think about Minge and all of the amazing things that it could do. And it's impossible to read these, but just think about this mind map as a way to think about a problem. Then we take the mind map and we think about how the organization needs to grow and how the typology of museum is changing. Museums are different for us now. This gallery, the Ottawa Art Gallery, is a perfect example of socializing and the variety of programming. And museums really need to respond to this. And so one little part of the mind map is about civic space and what could you do? You could open onto the plaza. You could offer um, the context of a museum to the public. You could do so many things that would make the museum open to the city. So something we do often with our projects and with very supportive clients is go traveling. So we. 
We literally did not pick up a pen and paper for one year on this project. We just explored together. And there were a series of trips all over the world, uh, particularly on the left to the Whitney, which had just opened at the time, um, to Mass Mocha, and there's director Rob Seidner talking to my dear friend Claude Cormier about open space and public space. And there the three of us are at the Fogg Museum at Harvard, which is really one of the most phenomenal museums I have experienced. There's Rob in London at the V&A. We had to explore bathrooms, of course, and how they're designed. And on Long Island on the right. So Rob and I became super close. Um, director and architect, and I think that trust level is so, so important. But seeing is, is really the way to build that trust. So we each came back from those trips convinced of the initiatives that we were pursuing. So here are all the initiatives that we decided to take on. Connecting to context, that's the Whitney. Engaging with exterior public spaces with art civic openness, the fog, social life and gathering space, SF MoMA, cross-pollinating program, that's the Paris in Miami, adding new program, the noise in Berlin, revealing the collection, the Broad, circulation experience, the Whitney, communicating content with digitally is the Cooper Hewitt, Emphasizing authenticity is Prada, and strengthening identity is LACMA in Los Angeles. So these are all places we went and decided that these initiatives were going to be Minge. So go back, going back to be the scientists or the, the mathematicians, we start calculating how these elements can connect to the mission of the museum. So we have 43 years of the museum, 153 years of the park, and 173 years of our city. So four major aspirations I'm gonna show you today because there are so many. Number one is blurring the boundaries of program. So we found this wonderful non-space in the corner of the building that was not historic was not designated, and we asked the historic board, could we add to it, and they said yes. So we built a theater, and it's exactly the same size as a loading dock that was in this space, and this theater opens on to the city, and it has become wildly successful. These were original section drawings done by a Carlton grad. And by, by building the theater, we were able to put a roof garden also on top. Here are some of the original renderings with a big glass wall looking out on a garden. And looking, the public looking into the museum from the street. The connection between an amphitheater and the theater itself and the construction of it, which was as complicated as the design. And then the joy of watching a performance happen. People come off the street and simply sit on the amphitheater. And people who have never seen art, never seen a dance performance, and they are so overjoyed by the opportunity and the gift to be able to do that. Aspiration number two, opening the museum to Balboa Park and to the city. So all those arrows are new doors. And they're new doors that we had to negotiate with the historic board to be able to open. But they bring light in and they project light outwards. And they invite people in to just experience the ground floor, which was um, is free to the public um, by the beautiful gift of a donor and we call it the living room of the park. It has a cafe, a gallery, a shop, an education center, um, 
the roof garden, and a coffee bar. So here's, here's the shop, which is coveted by the community. Um, the other way of opening up the museum to the community was to bring a library from the basement up to the main levels so that people could enjoy this amazing collection of books about design and art. On a Saturday, this space is full of kids. Looking from um, the library outwards, and the library with beautiful George Nakashima 1950s furniture that you can touch and feel and sit at. And the whole mission of Minge to be able to touch art um, comes, to, comes to life. And then back to the courtyard. So these were our original renderings of the courtyard where we're adding public space to a historic park. At nighttime, they have movie nights every Saturday night. And here it is in real life. A beautiful mural in the collection that was never able to be shown um, and now uh, has a permanent home. You'll notice a lot of these images. Furniture is a really important part of the scheme, too. All of the furniture is selected based on design, ethos. Um, these particular pieces are classic, obviously, 50s and 60s. We have some young artists who were commissioned to make pieces, but even that layer of the museum speaks to the mission. Reclaiming lost spaces. So this is a historic building from 1915, and it was shut down many times. It changed names. Its original purpose was the House of Mining in 1915 to talk about the gold rush of California. Um, but in the midst of all of that, many of the spaces were just shut down. So in this case, there's a bell tower on the back of the building and it had been hidden for about 60, 70 years. So we opened it up to display one of, probably the, one of the most important pieces in the collection. It's a Dale Chihuly sculpture. He's a glass artist from Seattle, and he gifted this piece to the museum. So a lot of the design process, you go back to the memories that you have of places you've been. And in this case, it was Anne Hamilton's piece in California of a tower leading to nowhere. But in this case, our tower needed to lead from the ground floor to the galleries. So we began a whole series of studies of the shapes of a tower that would hold the Chihuly and the staircase, uh, the grand staircase, up to the galleries. And here's the entry to that bell tower. This is a place where hundreds of people sit on a Saturday afternoon. On the left, the stair. On the right, the tower. I told Federica this story the other day, but this tower is made of Venetian plaster, and there are very few people in the world left, really, who truly know how to make Venetian plaster. It reflects uh, the shadows of the Chihuly in such a beautiful way. So the drywall company claimed they could do it, but had no one, really, to execute it. And this young, young Spanish man came to me, and he said, I think I can do this if you and I work together. So every Saturday, I would go to the site, and he had samples and samples. And we went through weeks and months of samples till we came to the moment where he had it right, and he was so proud of the work. He individually, by himself, plastered this 100-foot-tall tower. And it's building that pride and craft that I think is a responsibility of us as designers. So here's looking straight up at the Chihuly. And there it is from the gallery level looking out. 
so back to the hint. Um, so there are those women standing on the roof. No one had used the roof of this building since that day. So we went to the historic board and said, this is our precedent. We need to be able to use the roof. And they completely agreed. So here's the gallery level. And the yellow uh, outline is the terraces. So here were our images of people using the terraces during the day, having beautiful dinners at night. And these are the terraces now, which are full of people every weekend. They offer incredible views of the city and a wonderful way to gather in amongst the art. So, and of course, it is an art museum, <laughs> so we need to have galleries um, amongst all of the other functions that we've provided. But here's the top of the bell tower stair, um, and the galleries begin the craft and folk art displays. And then one really intimate room, which is called the Nakashima Room. This is a table made by George Nakashima in 1956. It is the boardroom table for the museum, but it's also a place you can just go in on a regular basis and sit at the table and chat with your friends. It's absolutely a stunning piece. And we extended it on the left and right, George's daughter, Mira, was commissioned by us to extend the table. The finish on those two pieces is completely different, and we were really overjoyed by that idea. The chairs are also Nakashima, and they come from four different decades of making. This space, to me, is a little bit like the Church of Mingbei. It's a wonderful place to just be quiet and and meditate. Um, the door on the right is a big sliding door that closes off the room when there's a meeting. And the handle on the door is a commission um, that we did with a woman who worked for me for 15 years. She was an architect, and now she's a jewelry artist. And she made this handle, which to me is like somewhere between architecture and jewelry. And it's just a wonderful piece. People caress it all the time. So that leads me to kind of the final discussion. I think one of the most absolutely most um, satisfying things about this 10-year project was commissioning artists and supporting them and making their lives richer for the, pur for the purpose. Uh, so I had a little list on the corner of my desk that um, was a list of people I thought were crafting art at the level of architecture. So they all happened to be women. Cool. Um, and we began commissioning them to not make art that just simply goes on the wall or sits on the floor as a sculpture. It's art that becomes intrinsic with the architecture. So it's art, I mean, for Minge's purpose, that has useful value, but also aesthetic beauty and meaning, sensual meaning. So it was an incredible journey, I think about three three and a half years of working with these artists during COVID from a distance. Some of them have not seen their work yet, but uh, it's it was really, if I could do that the rest of my life, I would be really happy. Um, so here are all the women. Uh, Sharon Stamper, who worked for me, myself, Todd Williams and Billy, well, Billy Sienna, of course, Todd always has to show up. He can never um, not be there. Christina Kim, Claudia Youngstra, and Petra Blay. Petra happens to be married to Rem Coolhaus. Um, all of this, m much of this work is on display in the exhibition as mock-ups. And I think process is so important for people to experience and see. And so you'll, when the exhibition, you'll see how we communicated which, with each of these artists. 
So Claudia is the first one. She lives outside of Amsterdam. She's a fashion designer turned activist. Uh, she, has a, she has a farm with these beautiful Dranthi sheep, which she shears herself. And then she grows all of the plants that create the dyes for her tapestries, her wool and felt tapestries. This was a tapestry I saw at Penn University in the library. It blew my mind. I knew about her and we had worked together, but I had never seen something of this scale. So here she's beginning to work for us at Minge. She's interested in the color black, which I am also interested in. <laughs> um, she's been studying Burgundian black for many years with the Rijksmuseum, thinking about what is the color black in the 17th century Flemish paintings. It's not really black. You can see a lot of indigo blue in some of these studies she's making. So these are the mock-ups you'll see in the exhibition of what she first sent us as a proposal for this tapestry I asked her to do in the cafe. So here's the tapestry being made um, in 2020. Um, you can see flecks of green and white and indigo. Uh, she made the building that this project sits in for the purpose. And here it is on the wall. So the useful value is that it's acoustic in the cafe. It's also a part of the collection now. And if we turn those lights off above the piece, it would be pitch black. But the color comes out by lighting it. And it's just become a really, really wonderful part of the experience. Christina Kim is also a fashion designer turned artist. She lives in Los Angeles. I've purchased her clothing for years, but when she started to work at the scale of architecture, that's when I was so fascinated. So you these, see these two orange stripes. In museums, exhibitions come up and they go down, and there's that moment where you're mounting an exhibition or removing it and it's not so pretty. So we wanted to create a series of diaphanous curtains that could shield that process, but also kind of make you curious about it too. So she is Korean and was looking at traditional Korean curtains, such as these in her studio in LA, which is so fascinating. And the left is a traditional, and the right is a contemporary version um, that she has uh, made. And you'll see that again in the exhibition. So here is one of the curtains in the gallery itself. She is a hand maker, but she was using a highly technological material called dyneema, that's metal, that's used for making camping tents. So all these artists were looking at the digital and the hand at the same time without us asking them to do it. Um, a, a really futuristic view of what Minge can be. It moves with the mechanical system in a really beautiful way. And there is a full stretch of it. And the museum loves this particular moment so much they've decided to keep it permanently up. And then the museum commissioned us um, as artists, architects and artists, to create a canopy over uh, the main space on the ground level. And so we looked at a lot of a series of historical images and we looked at some digital images, some old computer images, and a piano player image of a piano roll. 
And that started to make sense to uh, me and to us as a way to create a canopy. A canopy that had meaning, music being craft also. So this is a drawing of the ceiling of the main space. There is the piano um, roll. And here is the ceiling, which expand it spans from the cafe all the way to the retail space. And it's, it's fabricated by A. Zayner in Kansas City, a group that we collaborate with all the time. They are really fantastic. They were really the pivotal people allowing Frank Gehry to make his metalwork um, with um, technological software programming. They are so wonderful. We thought that we would just make repeated images. They said, absolutely not. You're going to play the entire song that you have in your head on this ceiling. And the song is, what are you doing the rest of your life? People interpret the ceiling in so many different ways, and that makes me very happy. And then we were also commissioned to do a fence. So in this courtyard, which we wanted to have open to the whole park, the Parks and Rec people said, no, you need to make a fence. And we said, a fence? That is so not Menge. But we took it on as a challenge, and we made a fence that, in a drawing, looks pretty normal. But in reality, is something completely different. So what are we looking at when we're looking at fence pickets? We're looking at candles. We're looking at Peter Alexander sculptures. And we develop a fence made of solid brass um, that is a series of individually twisted elements that are digitally cut and hand finished and twisted. So here's the hand twisting going on, and there's the fence, which in a drawing looks very, very normal. The parks and rec people were a little surprised, and the fence comes over and down into the theater space. And then finally, oh, not finally, two, two left, Todd Williams and Billy Sands. So we're going to go first full circle here to sen sentimentality where Todd and Billy came to speak at Carleton when I was a student in, I'm going to say, 1980. And I never forgot the lecture and the workshop they did. And when I graduated, Joanne Paul and I went to New York, and we visited their office. And we were so proud to be able to say hello to them. Well, since then, they've become some of my closest friends and collaborators and inspirations. Um, so. I asked if I could commission them to make the gallery benches for Minge, and they said yes. So Billy went back to her Chinese roots, Chinese heritage, of sitting on root stools, stools that were made of the roots of trees. And she was fascinated by that. So she said, let's make a bench that has a root on it, and we'll make the root art. And so we played around with roots for a whole summer together. And these are the root benches. So there are two that are wood roots, and there's one that's cast in bronze. And they're functional. They're, again, useful tools because you can sit on the bench and lean and take a rest. Or if you've had hip surgery, you can use them to lift yourself off the bench, which is what Todd and Billy do because they had surgery. Um, but uh, the full circle for me of commissioning them to do something special after meeting them at Carleton so many years prior was just such an honor. And you would be surprised. I mean, we thought maybe people wouldn't understand them or know what to do with them or should they touch them. But people hang out, lie on them, lean on them, read a book at them. 
And then finally, Petra Blay, an amazing woman who came to San Diego, I guess like right before lockdown. And she was fascinated by these trees, which are our street trees in San Diego, the jacaranda. The jacaranda was brought to San Diego by a woman named Kate Sessions, who was a uh, horticulturalist. And Petra was so uh, taken by her that she dedicated a theater curtain to Kate Sessions and the jacaranda. So this is the first rendering she sent us of a curtain that would become an acoustic curtain in the theater. Petra's done theater curtains all over the world, per also for RAM's projects, many. So these were some of the first um, drawings and renderings that she sent us. You'll see the mock-up in the exhibition, uh, all delivered to us during the pandemic with great passion. The rendering of how the curtain would look from the outside. This is the mock-up that's actually in the exhibition here. And there it is in real life. It is digitally cut felt that's hand-stitched. So once again, there's a digital aspect and a hand aspect to the work. And this, these works are a part of the architecture. They, the architecture couldn't work without them and vice versa. And that union and collaboration is just so intense, powerful and meaningful that um, we're just really proud to be a part of that. Here's from the outside of the theater, the detail on a sunny day. The performers who use the theater play with the curtain. They can move it around the space. And they, they adjust the acoustics of the space to meet their needs. And so in some ways, it's just so flexible. And here's our very small but mighty team that made the museum. Uh, Christine Kim on the left from Carleton University. And the rest of us from Savannah School of Art, Berkeley, um, Penn, and uh, UCSD. So we have a lot of different people in the studio who aren't necessarily architects, but we all collaborate together. And this tiny little team, which we started thinking, OK, well, who's going to do the floor? Which one of us will take that project on? turned out to be all of us doing this very, very large project together. And most of us never having done that scale of project before, but parsing it out into little pieces and realizing that we could do it, we could make it happen. So that's the story of Mingay. Would you like to take some questions? I think it takes everyone a minute just to <laughs> absorb all of that. It was amazing. But uh, Jen will take some questions. Mariana? a lot of challenges uh, specifically related with an existing building in existing context. Uh, but you did it, you did it in a great way. So if you can share a little bit about how us as architects and our students can deal with uh, this uh, situation that is more and more common, but with that sensitivity that you have uh, showed. Perfect, thank you.
it's not so typical in California to adapt a building. Usually they tear them down. So the idea of even saving a building is huge. And luckily, this whole district is restricted in, in that way. But we had to go to the historic board with a narrative about how we were going to honor the existing structure and bring it forward to the 21st century at the same time. Originally, like I was like, oh my god, I, I want to open this building up. I want to open it up. And it felt closed because it wasn't meant to be open. But they worked so closely with us because the narrative was strong. It was about sharing with community. It was about opening to a city as opposed to being shut down and hermetically sealed. So it's about bringing your community along with you with a really strong story. And that worked for us throughout. There are maybe 12 or 13 governmental agencies that we had to go through, and none of them said no. Because the story was very strong and heartfelt and, and caring of, of what our community was desiring, especially post-pandemic, I mean, amazing. So it's not, combat. it can't be combative, it has to be empathetic. Hi, my name is uh, Rez. I live in the, uh, in the neighborhood. I studied planning. I'm not working in the field. I work more in culture change at Global Affairs, but I'm really concerned about some of our cultural institutions, and I really enjoyed your presentation. And um, I've, been, I've been learning about the work of Nina Simon. She talks about the participatory museum and the need for maybe more audience participation to create our cultural institutions that are more dynamic, relevant, um, yeah, and interactive. We have a lot of cultural institutions in our city, uh, and we also have the concern about succession planning and audiences. We have young people that are creating new forms of media with their devices. So uh, any advice on how to get our cultural institutions on board with becoming more co-creative, more participatory? I spoke, I didn't realize on Thursday, to the interim CEO of the National Gallery of Canada. I mentioned it at a gathering, and uh, I see that Galleries and museums are great places for us to convene. We need to be seen and be heard post-pandemic. I don't want to be swiping to meet people. So um, any advice on how to make them more interactive, more co-creative? Uh, I don't know if they're listening. Um, there's potential, but if you have any advice, that'd be great. Thanks. I mean, there's so many ways to think about that. Maybe one of them is kind of to go back to the core root of, of the museum, and if it has a collection, to begin to share the collection more, to talk about cultural history uh, through a collection and bring it out of the basement and put it on display and allow kids to interact with it. Um, if institutions have invested so much time and money in these collections, they need to be shared. And I mean, it's one of my favorite things to go, my mom knows, is to the Met in New York, and I'll just wander one gallery for a whole day and feel like, see kids really interacting with sculptures and really understand that we're all learning from this. And yes, there are social aspects that can happen and educational ones, but just bring out your resources and use them. And this is something that we encouraged Mingate to do. And so the ground floor changes every two months um, to show different works. Hi, my name is Emma, and I'm so incredibly proud to be Jen's niece. Um, I am only 15, and sitting in this lecture was so incredibly captivating. You have no idea. So, 
I had the pleasure of visiting the Menge Museum this summer, and I was so, so amazed by the work she's done. I, to be honest, this was so mind-blowing to me. <laughs> um, so, Jen, my question for you is, what specific aspect was, uh, was your favorite creating this project? Um, for 20 something years, I've been making architecture for private people. Particularly things like Nissan where no one ever sees it. Which is super exciting, but in the end, not so satisfying. So to actually sit in the main floor of the gallery on a Saturday afternoon and anonymously, because you've got your mask on or whatever, and just watch the flow of people. Watch the joy in their eyes. Watch them diagonally cross the floor exactly the way you thought they were going to do it. And just be completely amazed that the drawing we make and the idea that we have can come to reality. I mean, it's still 30 years later it doesn't cease to amaze me that architecture has such a powerful opportunity to connect people. And, and that's, in the end, I mean, we connected with people throughout the process, but this idea of a young child who's never seen a work of art just going crazy in the museum and, and really being inspired is, is really my favorite part. And thank you for asking that question, Emma. for the uh, lecture, it's fantastic. Um, you spoke a lot about storytelling and about the importance of narrative, and I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about what form that storytelling took for you, how it was translated to the people who mattered, and how, uh, what role did it play in kind of converting this smaller project into a much larger one? I think, um, the travels together really helped. We traveled with board members, we traveled with the director, and um, often just supporters of the museum. And together we would build the narratives. And, and I think it's not just something you're doing independently as an architect sitting at your desk. You're actually working with your community to do it. So that by the time we got to an approval meeting, it was already, a sure thing that we were going to be approved because we had had so many conversations with with our community. Um, but it's also a it's strategic. You have to be very careful about how many ideas you would introduce at one time. And going from the small scale idea to the big or the big to the small. It was wonderful that it was a 10-year process because we could just strategize when each one was going to come forward as a conversation. And we had, you, know, you build on it from the idea of the building in the city to what the exhibition looks like. And I'm not sure I'd ever been quite that strategic before, but I think it was really worth sitting down and thinking about it as a studio, um, what are our priorities for the museum and how do we get it done? We also raised a lot of money as architects, which is not so common. Somehow, so during the pandemic, the museum was pretty scared because how do you raise money when you're under construction and no one can go see it and no one really has an idea of what's going on? So we had these monthly things called tea time talks. And Rob would pour a cup of tea out of a Japanese, beautiful Japanese vessel, and we'd have a conversation with one of the artists. And by the end of that talk, someone had funded that project. So it's sharing sharing the wealth of information that is our process, rather than 
isn't just the final product. It's how did we all get here and bringing people along for the story so that they own the story. It's a part of them too. I mean, it's, I it's, it's really hard to describe, but it's, it's really about collaborating, even with your donor and really understanding their um, point of view. So it was, it was a, an amazing process. I mean, it's a tiny, tiny institution that weighs $60 million, grassroots, like $1,000 at a time. Kind of the Barack Obama story, right? <laughs> so I hope that sort of answers your question. Uh, the, the presentations, yeah, I would do talks a lot, um, have gatherings, mostly on Zoom, of course, because we had to be, but yeah. Thank you. Um, oh, Jennifer, that was um, so wonderful. And you have, my question is, is going to be about the artist and the architect. And um, you're, you're great and at so many things, but one of the things that really struck me was your incredible um, ability to sort of surrender the project to artists at the right moments and to know kind of exactly who to turn to. And, you know, as it, I was telling you earlier, as we crossed paths for about a year, I guess, um, at, the, at Carleton when you were a student, and I guess I was in first year when you were in fifth, and you were always a legend and continue to be. Um, and I, I remained a kind of a fixture while I, I, I teaching there. And sometimes I have to have a, a kind of an uncomfortable conversation that I about to students about the fact that uh, the artist and the architect aren't quite the same person. And, and um, <coughs> because sometimes there's an ambition to be also the artist or the project is more maybe art than architecture. And, and, and there can be moments of, you know, kind of where I, I've said to students, you know, the good architect kind of turns this over to what you're trying to do here. Really, you need a great artist for that. And I feel badly sometimes about saying that. But y you, anyway, I'd love you to talk about that and the times where you go ahead and you made things too, artist, artful things. And yeah, that's, is that a question? Um, yeah, I think that turning over, yeah, absolutely. So I think being a little bit of an artist myself, dabbling and making objects, and I think I have a, a, an empathy and sympathy for that realm of making and discipline. But I was thinking about this very question Last week, I was in Montreal, and I was at the opening of the symphony, and the new conductor, Raphael Payari, who's actually the conductor in San Diego, and we all went to celebrate him. And I watched him moving with the orchestra behind him. It was Mahler's second, so there's 100 chorus people in the back, and there's all the orchestra, and there's trumpet players back here, and he's moving around, and he's doing this, and the conductor is amazing. And I thought, that's what architects do. We actually have this amazing team of people that we've amassed together. Their talents are incredible. And we're pointing to each one of them when their moment of shining comes forward when the bassoon needs to come forward or the trumpet. And we have to be humble in doing that. We have to let that talent come forward to, to shine. And we are the orchestrator of the whole idea, but we're not the author of the whole idea. And we shouldn't be because it would be boring we need to bring other talent with us. And that's why I mentioned we have filmmakers come to our meetings, our workshops, and poets. And because the other perspective is so interesting. We're thinking about the big picture a lot. And they're thinking about that sensual detail of one note coming forward in Mahler's second. 
so I, I just was fascinated watching Raphael move because I thought, oh my God, that's an architect, that's an architect. And it was the one way I could begin to describe what we do. We know the whole symphony, but we can't be the author of all of the notes. Does that make sense? We'll do one more question. Uh, Janine, uh, just behind you. OK, uh, thank you so much for, for the lecture. That was really interesting. Um, my question is about, um, so one thing that I feel like galleries face a lot uh, and kind of have to overcome is some kind of like imaginary barrier where like uh, art can be like intimidating sometimes. Uh, feeling like you understand art can be intimidating. Um, and so I think your example is like quite successful. Some of the anecdotes you said um, in kind of removing that barrier, like uh, the stories about people coming down to the amphitheater or touching the root benches. Um, but what are like in general uh, some architectural strategies you would describe to eliminate that kind of intimidation barrier that uh, the art and galleries have? That's a really great question because there's so many layers of answer to it, but. At the ground level, everything is familiar. The scale is familiar, it's not grand. So uh, materials are um, inviting. Um, the light from the outside comes in and it doesn't make you feel like you're going into a hermetically sealed place. Um, the doors are swung open so the air flows, so you can feel the breeze. It really feels like your living room, literally. And there are places to sit, and there's great description of the artworks, and the artworks are free. You don't have to pay to see them. So that's a huge barrier that's eliminated right away. And then, you know, in terms of Menge, the collection, it's called, Menge means, I should have said this at the very beginning, it means art of the people. So it's your art. It's not their art. It's art for you. It's art for every culture that might want to participate with it. So it, it, it makes it democratic and um, inviting. Lighting, I mean, it all makes a difference, but I think scale and material and light are probably the most important things. So I, I, we have uh, an, an opportunity to go downstairs and continue this conversation. Uh, in fact, Jen can continue it in the art engine space where there are examples of some of the things that she's shown tonight <laughs> with a glass of wine in your hand. Uh, but I'm um, uh, gonna turn it over now to my colleague, uh, Cheryl Boyle who has in some ways brought uh, Jen back to us to thank her. Wow. Jen, um, yeah, just on behalf of all the students that are here and the faculty and the school and of course the public that's here, thank you so much for showing us this building. I just cannot believe, um, I'm awestruck as well, how incredibly perfect that building was for you. That they found you is just really a stroke of luck for for the museum and that you were, you know, that's your first public building. It's as if they, you know, some, somewhere along the line, you know, the goddess wrote the program for Jen for her first public building and this would be it. And truly, I mean, really the, I mean, this kind of interaction, Janine nailed it, right? About the, you and the artist. I mean, uh, this collaboration and, and uh, you know, we're just, it's, it's, it's really amazing with an existing building, with artists, with their work, and there's so much learning going on. You have your own group of seven, you know, a little bit of Canada there, and Jen uh, in that image that we finish with. Um, yeah, it's just an incredible, and, and uh, I was just thinking, you know, it's like, it's like yes, it's a building, and, and it just, it didn't take three years, it took 10. I mean, this is the, the incredible, that's tempo, 
and the patience you demonstrate, like, I, I was like, that's just shocking, <laughs> right? And that they continued on. And I mean, that time, it's like a, a story of slow food, this incredible sensory, you know, delicacy that you dealt with everything and the craft to make it just so. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. We're just delighted to have you. Thank you. So before we adjourn uh, and head back downstairs uh, for more conversation, I just want to remind everyone, uh, we have another lecture next week. Uh, it's Adele Waiter, who's a former editor of uh, Canadian Architect, and she's just finished a book on the architecture of Ron Tom. Um, and so uh, she's coming to us next week to uh, give us a lecture and a book signing, and we're also using that particular lecture as an opportunity to, um, what would be the word, to inaugurate Architecture Week, which starts next Monday. So following the lecture, we will have a an, uh, an opening of Architecture Week reception. Now, uh, it won't be this venue next week. It will be the Carleton Dominion Chalmers Center. As you probably know, Carleton uh, decided it needed to get off campus a little bit more and into the city, so it bought uh, the Dominion Chalmers Center, uh, which is now turning over as a kind of cultural center downtown. Uh, so we are trying out that venue next week. Um, and we look forward very much to seeing you all there. Same time, not same place, but next week. <laughs>